stop worrying and get on with your life. And believe me, you and I will get on with our lives a lot better if we cut out the worrying business. Now you and I were not born with worry. Did you ever see a worried baby? <laughs> they only pick up worries as they get older from their fathers and their mothers and the people around them. When Almighty God sent us into the world, he sent us in here worry-free. But we hadn't any more sense than to pick up this uh, malicious habit. Now, there's a man named Maxi Maltzby, who is the director of an organization at the University of Kentucky called the Rational Behavior Therapy Center. Quite a name. And he says that worry is only an unnecessary mental pain. And that anybody can be cured of it and the cure is not all that complex. You know, I rather like that title, Rational Behavior Therapy Center. How'd they think that went up? That is exactly what this church is. A rational, that means sensible, behavior therapy, that is healing center. And that if a person's behavior isn't rational, that is, he has a lot of hates or a lot of fears or worries, he can come here and in this benign atmosphere, under the influence of the most sensible book ever written, he or she can be healed. Now, you better get healed of worry. I have a friend, a famous physician, who says, he's a great Christian layman, he said that if he could only preach one sermon in his lifetime, he would preach a sermon against fear. Because he says fear is the most destructive enemy of human personality. My old friend, Dr. Smiley Blanton, who, who started the Institutes of Religion and Health, which has become the most famous enterprise of its kind in the North American continent, and one of the most famous in the world, said, anxiety is the great modern plague. Not one of the great modern plagues, but the great modern plague. And what is anxiety? Well, I think it may be defined as a deep, dark, conflicted, un- intellectual feeling that something terrible is going to happen. And anxiety causes a person to waken in the middle of the night, moistening the dry lips, feeling a sinking in the pit of the stomach and a pseudo palpitation of the heart. Anxiety. Now, worry, the English word worry is taken from an old Anglo-Saxon word 
called, spelled W-Y-R-G-A-N, which I would imagine might be pronounced Wirgan. And what does that mean? It means to strangle or to choke. If I were to come out in the congregation now and grab you around the neck in this manner, pressing as hard as I could press, cutting off your air supply, I would be doing to you dramatically what you do to yourself if over a long period of time you are a victim of worry, an unnecessary mental pain which can be cured then how is it cured? It's cured by God, by Jesus, by faith, and by rational common sense. In the second chapter of Timothy, it says, God hath not given us the spirit of fear. He never gave it to you. You pick it up yourself. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You know, there's one of the greatest things in the world to have, a sound mind. And when you have a sound mind, which is a gift of God, you're not going to be a victim of worry, anxiety, or fear. Now, how do you apply rational, sound-mindedness to the problem? I was making a speech one night in Western Canada at a beautiful little town called Thunder Bay. And they actually made me an honorary citizen of Thunder Bay by the mayor. And the man who presided over the meeting said, in the course of our conversation, he said, you know, I used to be the greatest warrior in Canada. Now he said, do you know how big Canada is? I said, well, it's about 3,000 miles east and west. And he said, it's 2,000 miles north and south. And I was the greatest warrior in Canada. And he said it with some pride. <laughs> but he said, I am now the greatest unworrier in Canada. Why? Well, I said, this is a remarkable achievement. How'd you do it? He said, by several things. First. I applied my common sense to it. And I decided that in the name of God, it was stupid. So he said, now what I do, I used to be worried by everything. The first thing I do now is to, as a child of God, deny adverse circumstances and conditions. I look at them and I deny them. Now he said, I'm realistic. I know that this may be a tough situation. But the thing that is important about it isn't what the adverse condition is, but my attitude toward the adverse condition, my interpretation of the adverse circumstances. So I say to myself, these aren't adverse. Maybe, who knows? This is going to lead me to something greater. So he said, I'm no longer afraid of adverse circumstances because I deny them. And then he said, when I see a fear coming down the road at me, and you usually can see them coming, a big old fearsome problem, you know what I do? I said, no, what do you do? He said, I draw myself up to my full stature as a child of God, and I say to that fear your worry, where you been all this time? <laughs> I can handle you in the name of God. And you know, while he said that, I felt all my little troubles uh, slinking away. 
<laughs> under that kind of treatment. And then he quoted a line from Basil King, who wrote an immortal classic on fear many years ago. King said, be bold and mighty powers will come to your aid. Don't quail and be afraid and timorous and scared. Be bold and out of the universe, out of yourself, you'll bring mighty powers that will come to your aid. And the fourth thing he said was, picture good events happening to you. He was way ahead of his time. I, this was several years ago when the man told me this. This is what they call visualization. This is picturization. This is imaging. Image good events in the name of the Lord happening to you. Now, if you've written those four things down, don't ask me to repeat them. I could hardly think of them the first time around. I <laughs> can't repeat them. But if you've got those four things in your mind, you can go away from Marble Collegiate Church this morning and uh, you can stop worrying and get on with your life. Then you've got to apply just plain little common sense procedures to it. I had the pleasure and privilege of knowing the slightly, not too well, the late Lord Rank, who was the greatest motion picture manufacturer in Britain. He was also a very great Christian man, a leading Methodist of England. And I preached one time in a big hall behind Westminster Abbey. And Lord Rank sat right down there in front of me. Big, fine looking man. And uh, I was talking along this line somewhat. And after the service, he came back in the minister's office and I had a little talk with him. He said, you remember what the Bible tells us to become as little children? He said, what does that mean? Well, he went on to answer it himself. He said, to do the simple things because only that mind is, is great which can be simple. And he said, I've tried to do these simple things. Now, he said, I have a, an office that's 13 steps from the street. And when my chauffeur drives me up there in the morning, uh, being my age, he said, and having a little heart trouble, I take each step slowly. I stand on the first step, and I pray for my dear wife. Then I go up to the second step, and I pray for one of my sons. Then I go up to the third step, and I pray for my other son. And so on, up the steps. Thirteen prayers as I come up. And in the evening, I pray thirteen prayers going down. Now, here was this uh, enormous industrialist who had the wit, the genius, and the skill to be simple. And he said, out of that, I've acquired a beautiful sense of the presence of the master. Now, he said, I used to be a, a terrific warrior, but I learned how to lick that. He said, I, I organized the Wednesday Worry Club. It met every Wednesday afternoon at 4 p.m. And I would take all the worries that would come along through the remaining part of the week, and as the worries came up, I wouldn't worry about them then. I'd put them in a box to be worried about Wednesday afternoon at 4 o'clock. 
And he said, I was the only member of the club. <laughs> and Wednesday afternoon at 4 o'clock, I'd take all these worries out, put them on the table, spread them out, and see what the status of my worries were at the time. And I would find, he says, that 90% of them could be crumpled up and thrown in the wastebasket because they hadn't happened and they were finished. Well, I said, my Lord, uh, that was an, uh, not a, a profane statement. That was a, <laughs> a reference to him. That's the way you speak to a Lord in England. <laughs> I said, but my Lord, what do you do about those 10% that you've put back in the box? He said, I put them back in there to be worried about next Wednesday afternoon at 4 o'clock. <laughs> well, you know, one time I, I gave that sermon here, in the, that story here in the church, and there was a man here, a very great leader in a big city out west, very intelligent man. He said that was the brightest thing he ever heard in a sermon. And I thought he must not have heard many sermons. <laughs> because I've even said better things myself. <laughs> but, said he, I had a lot of worries. And I went down to my office the next morning after listening to you get that thing off. And he said, I wrote all my worries out on little slips of paper. And then I examined one and I said to myself well why worry about that thing that's all gone by so I rolled it up and he said when I was a kid I used to sit in church and shoot paper wads <laughs> and this came in handy now because I shot it at a wastebasket and it caromed off the desk and landed in the wastebasket and I said goodbye to you <laughs> and then he said a few of them missed and I went over and scooped him up. He said, that Lord Rank must have been a very wise man because when you objectify, dramatize a handling of a pernicious mental habit and exorcise it out of your mind and like a child, throw it away. Somehow or other your mind accepts the fact that it has been discarded. And I have been able, since I heard you tell about Lord Rank, to conquer my worries as I never did before in my life. How sensible St. Paul is when he says, God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And you know, in any series of three, power, love, sound mind, it doesn't go down, it goes up. If you have the power of the Lord, and if you have the love of God, then you come to the apex of your development and you have a sound mind. And then you're able to handle things. Now, I don't want you to think I'm theorizing about this because like everybody else, I've had this problem myself. Still have to keep working at it occasionally. We're, we're born and we live in a worry civilization. So how can you keep from getting smeared by it? The only way you can keep from it is to become a greater person of prayer and dedication, commitment to Jesus. Jesus is wonderful. It says in the Bible, have this mind which in you which was in Jesus Christ our Lord. He went through every kind of thing, but he had a a sound, controlled, mental attitude toward everybody and everything. And he survived as the epitome of the ages because he had that kind of mind. 
Now, I fly a great deal. I've, fl I, I've flown a lot of miles. And I have great admiration for the aeronautical industry around the world. It's near seeing the perfection you can almost get. Great industry. And I have great respect for the captains, the pilots, the flight attendants, the ground crews and everything. Well, Ms. Peel and I were on a plane not long ago coming from Albuquerque via Dallas to New York, Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. And they kept us in the, that airport for a long time because they said the weather was abominable in New York. Very, very low ceiling. Finally, they let us go. And when we got about halfway to New York, it was impenetrable. And we circled for a long time. I knew we were in a metropolitan area. And finally, the plane went down, down, down. Still, you couldn't see a thing. Finally, just, I got a flashing glimpse of a bridge. It looked to me like the Verrazano Bridge. But we were very close to it, I thought. And then I knew we were coming up the river. Now, either you come up the river or you come up around on the east side of Manhattan. But this was up the river. And then I said to myself, this plane's going back up again. And the captain come on in that professional tone that he has, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to tell you, tell you that we made an attempt to land at LaGuardia, but uh, we were waved off, and uh, we have to go up and go around again. It'll take us about another 20 minutes. So I thought to myself, when you go up, how about all those stacked planes that are, how'd you get through them? And then he went around for another 20 minutes. And he finally went down, down, down. And then all of a sudden he went up again. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, we came down, but the runway was occupied by another aircraft and we have to go up and around again. And, uh, I said to myself, am I afraid? And then I thought, this is routine to these people. They've got all kinds of uh, scientific gadgets. So I prayed for the captain up front, his co-pilot, the navigator, all the other crew. Prayed for the ground. And then we circled around. And I, I pulled out of my shirt pocket a card that I always carry in my shirt pocket over the heart. Lord, help me to remember that nothing is going to happen to me today that you and I together can't handle. And I added to that, and the pilot. <laughs> Strangely enough, it's a, it amazes me by figuring this way about the rational handling of an airplane in the pilot's hands and in God's hands and in the hands of many dedicated people. I had no fear, though I did think of what could happen. Later in the taxi cab coming home, uh, my wife Ruth told me she went through the same mental process. We were on the wavelength of St. Paul that afternoon. That flight attendant is a member of this congregation and she told me later, her husband told us later, it was the most apprehensive situation she'd been in in 10 years of flying. She must have thought about it the same way we did. God hasn't given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, the ability to think your way into peace and understanding. So stop worrying. Get on with your life. Our Heavenly Father, 
thank you for the marvelous way in which you help us. It's wonderful. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.